Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and no global issue is more front and center today than is Islamic fundamentalism and its wave of terrorism. So I am most pleased to be sitting once again with one of world Jewry's foremost authorities on modern Islam, Dr. Daniel Pipes, president of the Middle East Forum and publisher of its Middle East Quarterly uh, Journal. Daniel Pipes has a PhD in medieval Islamic history and his doctoral dissertation became his first of 16 books entitled Slave Soldiers in Islam. Daniel has taught world history at the University of Chicago at Harvard. He's taught policy and strategy at the U.S. Naval War College. Daniel also served at the State Department in policy planning. And Daniel Pipes is also the founder of Campus Watch, which critiques academics writing about the Middle East. And Daniel, it is always so wonderful to have you here. You are one of my favorites. Thank you so very much. So thank you so much, Mark, for the invitation and the generous introduction. Thank you. You've been speaking about this issue, the issue of Islamic fundamentalism, really almost longer than anybody else. You were telling all of us to be aware of it, to be cognizant of it, and also in some ways to understand the threats it poses. At the same time, you have been a voice of balance and reason. I want to just begin, Daniel, by giving you a chance to speak about how you view both Islamic fundamentalism today and the way in which we in the West tend to react to it. It's been a long time building <clears throat> the interest and concern about what I call Islamism, which you're calling fundamentalist Islam. Uh, it took decades, really, for people to get co concerned. The Iranian Revolution was back in 1978, 79, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And yet it took another 20-some years, let's say till 9-11, for Americans to focus, or bro more broadly, Westerners, to focus on this issue. And even then, there wasn't that much concern, and it's been growing since. So it, it took a long time. Uh, By the way, in terms of where we are today, it's really ISIS that put this thing on the map, don't you think? ISIS has contributed a lot, but Al-Qaeda had its role. Yes. The Iranian government had its role. And the, the Hamas, Hezbollah, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. There's, Are they all part of the same process? And I might add also the groups and movements in the West, domestically, not very far from where we are right now. For example? So, number one example in the United States would be the Council on American Islamic Relations called CARE, which is very vociferous and aggressive and become well known in this country. So the issue has grown and grown in reality and in perception. And as it has, what I find is that people have become too stringent and too opposed not just to Islamism, but to Islam. And we have a perfect case just before us in the last few weeks, kind of summertime folly on the beaches of France, where various mayors took it into their heads to ban a female swimwear called the burkini. What it is is modest swimwear. It's not that different from the so-called kosher swimwear that some orthodox women wear. In other words, it's a way for women, or for that matter, their male equivalents, to go to the beach, to go in the water, uh, to be out in the sun, not to show much. In some 30 places in France, the mayors have said it's illegal. Why? Well, that's where it gets interesting, because they, in France, unlike the United States, they have what they call laïcité, which is a more robust version of our secularism. There has to be complete separation of religion from the public space. So, for example, in French schools, you may not wear what they call an ostentatious cross, a kippah, or a hijab. These are all religious garbs that they don't allow. And now what they're saying, well, the same thing applies to the beach. It's a public place. So it's all about the symbolism of it. To which I say, no, you can't do that. 
you can't tell people how to go to the beach. And what I'm finding is that when I take a stand like this, is that so many people I work with and are allied with and friendly with are opposed to what I'm saying. I'm saying, wait a minute, this is symbolic. And as one person put it to me, what the swastika is to Nazism, the burkini is to Islamism, which is, I think, preposterous. Mm -hmm. Nobody puts the burkini on any kind of you know, flags or banners. But it's become very emotional, and I think people are going too far. So part of my role now is to say, whoa, hold your horses, not, don't go so far. Uh, let's think this through. That's a new role for you, Daniel. Yeah, I was the hard edge, yeah. <laughs> and now I'm uh, the one saying, let's think this through. For example, I believe that Muslims have the same rights and responsibilities as any other citizens. I think we'd all agree. On that. I'd also say that we have some fundamental features of the United States or any other Western country, our constitutional order, which anyone coming here must accept. We can probably all agree on that too. Finally, I would say that we have legislatures because things change over time. There's not one static set of rules mm -hmm. and that's it. For many different reasons, things change. So you, you change at the margins, you, you adapt, and that's valid too. So my view is that Muslims are welcome and should accept the constitutional order. And that said, we can adapt to them. You know, there are special needs that Muslims have, special interests. Well, that's workable. Mm -hmm. um, but is this a problem but it's, it's in the fun. United States? Yeah, you mentioned yeah. pa uh, France. Is this a, have you seen a tangible issue? These issues come up all the time. Can you give me an example? Uh, there was one a few years ago that got a lot of attention about building special ablution uh, facilities and airport uh, bathrooms for Muslims. Uh, clearly this is not something that the taxpayer should have to fund. Clearly there is a new need in, in I think, the case at hand, Minneapolis, uh, the great majority of taxi drivers are Muslim. And they well, have a reasonable right to do their ablutions before their prayers. It doesn't bother anyone. But it does bother people if they stick their feet in the sinks and it gets wet. So it's a good idea to have special facilities for ablution. And people so, objected? People objected. My solution was the following. We have a history of the government making available land, or in this case just a little piece of, 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 of the uh, toilet area, uh, for private citizens to build on. For example, at the Air Force Academy, there's a well-known Jewish chapel. The Air Force Academy made the piece of land available. The Jewish community built the chapel. That's a pretty good precedent. You could do the same thing here. The airport gives them the little area for mm -hmm. the ablutions, mm -hmm. and the Muslim community builds the ablution area. You can find solutions. Uh, but it takes creativity, it takes goodwill, it takes thought. There are no special accommodations for Muslims. Muslims don't get special deals. The problem is that the Muslims have been pushing, the Islamists have been pushing in particular, for special deals. A notable case was in Boston, where the Islamic Society of Boston got a fine piece of land for about 10% of its value because of hanky-panky and because there was pressure from the outside because they had an internal agent and the like. That's not acceptable. You're critical of that, are you? Very not? critical, mm -hmm. yeah. The, the Boston city authorities allowed this to go through in a way they shouldn't have. And the newspapers and television stations were very careful not to upset it. So, you know, yes, Muslims have rights. Yes, Muslims have responsibilities. Not special rights, not special responsibilities. They should be integrated. And I think it's possible, but it takes goodwill. And, not always to be found historically on the Muslim side where they're just pushing and pushing and being aggressive and now increasingly on the non-Muslim side where there's, as in this case of the Burkini, you know, unreasonable demands. And, and in this case, I might add, the Prime Minister of France has vouched for the Burkini ban. Mm -hmm. uh, there is this, you get two strains. One strain says Islam as a whole is a threat to Western civilization, that <clears throat> there are moderate uh, members of Islam, moderate Muslims, but the truth is that when you hear what 
is presented in mosques throughout the world. And even I've heard people come here and sit where you're sitting and say, don't fool yourself. It's being said in, in American mosques as well. A certain kind of Islamism which suggests that there is a goal for the world of Islam, and the goal for the world of Islam ultimately is everybody should be Islam. Everybody should be a member of the Islamic religion, and the only issue is to what extent do you force people to do it, and to what extent do you do it gradually over time. There are others who say that there are two branches of Islam. On the one hand, there is fundamentalism, Sharia law, what ISIS and Al-Qaeda represent, they're the violent ones, but that the vast majority of members of Islam are peace-loving and read the Quran in a very different way. And the analogy is always made, it was made, by the way, by Fareed Zakaria on CNN, who said, yes, there are passages that are objectionable in the Quran, but he then went to the book of Deuteronomy, and he found passages there which talk about uh, ultimately you, what you do to the non-believer. It was, by the way, the non-believing Jew, not to the non-believing non-Jew. And he also points out that the book of Leviticus says that you are to stone the homosexual to death. That according to strict Torah law, homosexuality is a capital crime. And Fareed's point was... We criticize the Quran, but we don't criticize our own Bible, Old Testament, whatever he would call it, which has some of the same material. And the real issue is not what the, does the Quran say any more than what the Torah say, says. It matters how the tradition has interpreted it. And just as there is in the Jewish world, interpretation of these passages which change their meaning we should understand that the same is being done inside the Islamic world with the Quran, and we shouldn't believe that a strict fundamentalist reading of Quran as the caliphate wants to present it is, quote, authentic Islam. It may be an authentic Islam, mm -hmm. but it is not the overarching authentic Islam. And what American Jews are trying to understand is to what extent is there legitimately a distinction which Americans must make in their mind to be in some way at war with a very small piece of the Islamic world, but not at war with Islam in general. When they're watching you on JBS, no one can give us an answer better than you can. How do you, what do you want us to understand? How do you teach this dilemma of understanding the distinctions which should or should not be made between fundamentalist Islam and Islam as a whole? Let me start with the Quran versus the Bible. Uh, the Bible certainly has verses which are out of date from our point of view. We don't follow its, its strictures. No one follows all Including the strictures. Including rabbinic tradition. Right. Uh, that said, uh, the Quran has a political quality that the Bible does not. And many of the admonitions are forever. In much of the Bible, what you see are very harsh descriptions of what happened several thousand years ago, but they're not meant for people today. The Quran is different. The Quran is, of all scriptures, the most political, the most supremacist. There's no getting away from this. It really is. That said, I do agree with Zachariah, uh, Zachariah that um, the Quran is what you make of it or as my favorite Egyptian philosopher puts it, Hassan al-Hanafi, the Quran is like a supermarket. You can take from it what you will. You can emphasize this. You can interpret that. You can decide that this one overtakes that verse. Uh, there, there are many things you can do to interpret it as you wish. The problem is that, say, compared to a century ago, the reading of the Quran these days is much more harsh, much more medieval, much more retrograde than it used to be. There was a movement to understand the Quran in modern terms. It was doing quite well a century ago, say 1916. It's not doing so well today. It is the most hard line. Look at ISIS. It, it is inconceivable to go more hard line than ISIS. Mm -hmm. ISIS is trying to pretend that we're still a thousand years ago and applying things, in, I mean, having slaves, you know, beheading 
burning people alive. They're, they're going back as purely as they can to the Sharia, the Islamic law, as it used to be understood. That's the thrust these days. And that's people are saying that's an aberration, Daniel. The Islamist movement as a whole, whether it be ISIS at the extreme end, or let's say a Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, at more or less the other end, but they're all applying Islamic law. Now, Erdogan is not applying it in this pure medieval fashion, by no means, but he's applying Islamic law. He's, and, and the entire Islamist movement, perhaps a, a comparison is useful. The communist movement had many different parts of it. You had the most sanguinary in, in China and Russia, and you had the, most, the least sanguinary in, say, France and Italy. Uh, but it was all part of the same communist movement. Uh, they had different personnel and different tactics and to some extent different philosophies, but they're all aiming for a worker's paradise. And here they're all aiming for a caliphate with Islamic law. And Who's Islam. all? All the Islamists. All the communists wanted that, all the Islamists want this. But, but you, their tactics okay, on how to get Okay, but you're making a distinction between Islamists and the world of Islam, correct? Yeah, Islamists, it's hard to estimate. My, my general figure is 10 to 15 percent of Muslims are Islamists. 10 to? 15 percent. 15 percent. So a, a minority, but a, as, in, as in other cases, a dynamic minority that has money and ideas and organization and can move things. Very, very important minority. Uh, and what we're seeing as the Islamist rise continues is pushback. There are increasing numbers of Muslims are saying no. And when you have an ISIS phenomenon that's so horrific, you have more and more Muslims saying, I don't want anything to do with that. I reject that. Oh, that's and very important because very often you hear, in, you hear here in America a criticism of moderate Muslims and American Muslims for not being vocal enough against the Islamists. Well, they're finding their sea legs. They're just beginning to develop organizations. They're just beginning to develop ideas. They're somewhat intimidated. They don't have much funding. They're threatened by the Islamists. Uh, so yeah, I join in that criticism. I'd like to see more uh, Muslims distancing themselves and uh, rejecting Islamism than is the case, but it's growing. It's certainly more than it was, say, 20 years ago, when you can barely find these voices. Symbolically, when I get an email from someone with a Muslim name that I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, I would cringe. Now I can't wait to see what the contents are. Increasingly, I'm getting communications from people who agree with, uh, encourage me, looking for some kind of help. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent is Islamism in any way a, an active part of the American Muslim community? Yeah, it's the organizations are virtually all Islamist, uh, the major ones, the ones that get invited to the White House, breaking of the fast, iftar dinner, the ones that get on major media, the ones that uh, get invited to the... Uh, You're saying the, they are? They are. They are Islamists. The Islamists dominate. They, they go back to 1962. The Saudis founded the first Islamist organization in this country in 1962, over 50 years ago. And they've been spawning other organizations. They get money from abroad. Uh, they have an ideology that gets supported uh, by many American institutions. I mean, many churches have decided the only real Muslims, authentic Muslims, are the, uh, are the Islamists. They're the ones you should be talking to. They're the ones you should deal well, with. Well, doesn't that upset you or concern yeah, yeah, you? Yeah, it sure does. And uh, in some way, you know, that counters the whole stream of your point, because on the, what you seem to be saying was 85% of the Islamic world is not Islamist. It is not in a cultural war against the West. But wait, is that a fair statement? 85% of the Muslim world is not in a culture war against the West. No, I didn't say that. I said 85% are not Islamists, but you can be anti-Western for many other reasons. How serious is the other 85% in being anti-West? Um, let's take Turkey. The, uh, 
Islamist party is half, it gets half the country's votes. I don't know if half, I don't know that half of the Turks are Islamists, mm -hmm. but it gets half the votes. And the other two non-Kurdish parties of Turkey are not Islamist. One is Ataturkist, one is nationalist, and they're also anti-American. In fact, in some ways, they're more anti-American than the Islamist party. Uh, polls show that a very small proportion of Turks are pro-Western, pro-American. But would they go to war against the West? Would they want to hurt? Well, that wasn't really the yes, topic. Yes, right. I'm, I'm changing the question. It's cultural. Sort of. Yes. No, well, it, it, no very few would engage in... Okay. So if they're at war, it's an ideological war. They don't like the West. And by and large, we don't like them either. But you pointed correctly that there are two arguments, one saying that all Muslims, in effect, are Islamists in some way or other, and the other saying, no, as I do, they're not. But there's a third position, which you didn't articulate, which is very important. I'd call it the establishment position. The establishment position says this is not about Islam at all. How many politicians have come out and said, in the most preposterous statement that I can imagine, that ISIS is not Islamic? It's like saying the Pope is not Catholic. And yet, virtually every politician comes out and says, my favorite quote of all, there have been so many, the Prime Minister of Japan, the Prime Minister of Britain, the President of the United States, but my favorite is Howard Dean, who said something along the lines of, the, uh, the leadership of ISIS is about as Muslim as I am, and he's not a Muslim. Uh, yeah, just dismissing it. So this establishment position, which reads out, bleaches out any Islam from the political violence, uh, from the, the movement, is in power. It's in power in government, in major media, in universities, and so forth. And you are talking so, about so the, the President of the United States. So, yeah, among many, many others. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a minority, a, a, a somewhat powerless minority that's having this debate over the nature of Islam. Interesting. The what's powerful the, element will okay. not will not want to talk about it. What's the therefore? What's the downside of an American administration saying ISIS is a bastardization of Islam and therefore it should not be called Islam? Why does it matter one way or the other? whether the administration or anybody in America does call something like ISIS Islamism or Islamic? I believe that just as a doctor must identify and name a disease in order to treat it, so a strategist must name and identify the enemy. Why? And if you can't figure out who your enemy is... You know who your enemy is. It's ISIS. What no, do you ISIS care what you, what, what, what matter whether a, you call it? ISIS is, is a very superficial, small phenomenon. Our enemy is Islamism. Broadly speaking, it's like saying our enemy is Nazism or communism. These are large international movements that take different forms, some more aggressive, some less aggressive. I mean, Peron was not the same problem as, as Hitler, or Mussolini was the same problem as, as uh, the uh, Japanese. Uh, the fascist movement, I shouldn't say Nazi, the fascist movement was large and included different elements some of which we could get along with better than others, some of which we couldn't get along with at all. Likewise, the communist movement. Likewise, the Islamist movement. So ISIS, you can't get along with at all, granted. But Erdogan, you can work with in some ways. But I would argue that they're all enemies. They're all enemies. All the Islamists are enemies. And maybe someday one can imagine a version of Islamism which is so changed that we can live with it. I mean, we're living with the Chinese now. They're communists, but it's not really communism. Maybe someday there'll be an Islamism that isn't really Islamism, and we can live with that too. But right now, it's a virulent ideology. It's the only one in the world. Is Islam a religion of peace? The president tells us Islam is a religion of peace. Is it? Actually, to be accurate, it was George W. Bush who said that, not Barack Obama. He's never said it, to my knowledge. Bush said it early on. You now, are right. Of course it's not a religion of peace. What does that mean, a religion of peace? It's a religion that's been around for over 1,400 years on many continents with over a billion practitioners. Uh, they're not all peaceful. Uh, and more than that, the Quran is a bellicose document. It, just it is a, it is a war document. Whether, it's not about Muslims are peaceful. It's whether a document, a holy document... The Quran document, is not a peaceful document. Is it not a peaceful document in way... Does it, is it distinguishable from the Jewish Bible and the Christian New Testament 
in terms of this issue, peacefulness. Yes, yes. It is, it is, as I mentioned before, it's very different. It's unlike not only the Jewish and Christian Bibles, but any other major religious scripture. It is a political document, and it has a drive for dominance that one doesn't find elsewhere. The quintessential figure in the Jewish tradition is Moses. In the Jewish tradition, Moses is the teacher. We call him Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our rabbi meaning teacher. The quintessential figure in Islam is Muhammad, who was a warrior. Mm -hmm. That's the, the essence of the man. By the way, he was a warrior who also taught, stood for something. But his role, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is as a warrior leader. What do you make of the fact that you have a tradition of Judaism with Moshe, Moses, Christianity has Jesus, all about standing for peace and love, and you have a religion here where the quintessential figure is a warrior. It's significant, but I, I don't think we should focus too much on Why? founding figures and founding scriptures. Why? Because I, why does it I'm speaking as a historian, yes, because what's it really it interesting to me is not so much what the scripture said 1,400 years ago or 2,000 years ago or 2,500 years ago, but how the Jews, Christians, and Muslims have lived since then. And, and how have the, certainly how Christianity have the has not lived? been a religion of peace. No, Do true. I need to give you examples? No, you Let don't. me just say the conquistadors in Latin America. I mean, whatever Jesus was, not all Christians were. So uh, there is not a direct connection. Let, as a historian, I look at what people have done. And I would say that Christianity has gone through an enormous metamorphosis in the last century or so. It has become a religion of peace in general. I mean, there are fringe exceptions. But overwhelmingly, Christianity has moved to return to this Jesus spirit, which it didn't have for a long time. Read anything about, say, Britain in 1800 and the nature of Christianity. It's very alien very different from what we know today to be Christianity. Well, I believe that Islam can go through a similar kind of evolution. But it hasn't yet. It hasn't yet. There are elements, there are wisps here and there, but no, it hasn't yet. In fact, the reverse. If we were speaking a century ago, in uh, 1916, I'd have said to you, it looks like Islam is going that direction. But now, for at least uh, 40 years, since the mid-70s, Islam has been going rapidly in the direction of more aggression and more retrograde and more Sharia and more traditional readings with ISIS being the culmination, the absolute culmination. I cannot imagine a group that is more extreme in its effort to go back uh, uh, to Muhammad's time and get inspiration from it. Although there's still only 15 percent. Well, ISIS is, is far smaller than 15 percent, but the Islamists are uh, a limited number but they have a reach, they have an ability to get into the educational system, into the legal system, political system, uh, that is beyond their numbers. However, I think there is some good news. Uh, in my view, the Islamist movement, which started in the 1920s, it, it was a stepchild of the totalitarian movements in Europe of the 1920s, in particular the fascist movement in Italy, but also the communist movement in Russia, and then subsequently the Nazi movement in Germany. But the Italian one was the most important example. So it's close to a century old now, 90 years old, and it has been on the upsurge all through that time, in particular the coming to power of Ayatollah Khomeini in 1979, very, very important event. Uh, but it is my estimation that it, I think it's peaked and going down. Uh, it's somewhat tentative. I'm alone in this. Mm -hmm. But I think about four years ago, 2012, 2013, the movement peaked. And there are two, th two elements to I think it's going down, diminishing. One is that the Islamists can't work together. They did do that previously. The Salafis and the Ikhwanis, the, the ones with the beard down to here and the ones with the beard like I have, could work together. Look at Egypt now. They're at dagger's edge. They can't, they're fighting each other all the time. The Sunnis and the Shia could work together. Now they can't. The monarchists and the republicans could work together. The violent and the nonviolent could work together. And now they're fighting each other. The best example would be Syria, where the Iranian-backed Shiite-oriented jihadis are fighting the 
Turkish and Qatari and Saudi-backed Sunni jihadis. And it's a horrible war. So that's one element. They're fighting each other. They're weakened by that. The second element is that as Muslim populations get to know Islamism, the sheen disappears. Uh, the Iranians have been under Islamist rule now since 1979, close to four decades. And estimates suggest that 80, 85 percent of them don't want anything to do with the system. The, the Egyptians had one year of Mohammed Morsi. They got rid of him. World's largest political demonstration took place there. And elsewhere as well, one can see that to know the Islamists is to despise them. And so between these two factors, the internecine warfare and the unpopularity of the program, I think the Islamists are weaker, are getting weaker, despite their gaudy successes in something like mm -hmm. uh, Somalia or Nigeria. I think they're getting weaker over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, Nigerians, Somalis and others, uh, Syrians and Iraqis and others are horrified by what's taking place. And yes, there are some Muslims who are attracted to this, no question, especially prominent are the foreign fighters going to join ISIS. It's an interesting and important phenomenon. I don't deny that. But I think far more important than those thousands who are attracted to ISIS are the tens of millions who are repulsed by it. So ISIS actually is, I think in the long term, damaging the Islamist movement. Fascinating. Also, when you hear people argue, is or is not Islamism an existential threat to the United States. How do you answer that? Uh, yes, it is. It is? It is, in, in that uh, this is a group of people who wish to replace the Constitution with the Quran, and that is something we haven't encountered before in this way. But, but, but what far more than they us, to us? Far more than us, look at Europe. But to us, are yeah, they an uh, existential yeah. threat to yeah. the United States of As America? As the numbers grow, uh, th as the influence grow, as grows, as the means grow, yes. yes. Daniel, I just heard you tell me you, th you feel it's peaked, this yeah. entire movement is peaked, it's on the wane. It doesn't you, mean one, ha one doesn't have to fight it. And It would be like me coming to you in, in 1960-something and saying, you know, I think the Soviet Union has peaked. I think it would have been accurate. doesn't mean there was another mm -hmm. uh, 25 years of trouble. Mm -hmm. It had to be... And contained. Are there enough Islamists in the United States to pose an existential threat to no, us? No, they're not now, but in the future there could be. I mean, we're, look at Europe, at the changes that are taking place there, at the fundamental shifts that are taking place in countries like Germany and Sweden. Uh, we could have that too. We could have that too. Well, was this result of their immigration policies? Yeah. Are you saying, therefore, that you do not want America to adopt open borders and simply allow anybody from <laughs> yes. the Islamic world in? Well, I don't want open borders for anyone, but in particular, not for uh, Muslim immigrants. We need to vet them very carefully to make sure that these are not Islamists. Uh, it's not something we're doing. That we need the equivalent of the McCarran Act, which was passed uh, some 60 years ago, to keep out communists. We need something like that to keep out Islamists. Why do you think it was, going back to this insight you had, that there's not only the two groups that I mentioned, but there's also the administration and those in the establishment who say there is no, you know, ISIS is not Islamic, we shouldn't even use the word. What do you believe motivates politicians to take that position? A couple of things. First is the respectable, if misguided, effort not to rile up Muslims. If you say anything about Islam, you worry that Muslims will get upset with you. So you say, no, 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 it's nothing to do with Islam. It's just radical extremism, violent extremism, and so forth. You don't want to get anybody upset. Second, is there a legitimacy to that? No, no. But it's, I respect it, though I think it's wrong-minded. Uh, secondly, there's an effort uh, not to change the way we, we, which we live. Uh, it would be difficult if every flight you went to leaving New York City were an experience like leaving Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv. Imagine you're flying to Chicago and you have to get to the airport three hours early and go through lines like that and all this questioning. People don't want to go through that. And, and all the rest that acknowledging that Islam 
has an element of importance here. And the third thing is fear of being called names, a racist, a so-called Islamophobe, and the rest. If you're chief of police somewhere, that's the last thing you want to be called, so you just simply deny. I had an interesting experience. I spoke once in Australia to a police department, or the um, leadership of a, of, a law, of a law enforcement in that city, and I talked about Islam and how you need to pay attention to this element. And the most vociferous opponent I had uh, afterwards came up. And it turned out he had a PhD in this subject. He knew very well all about the Islamic component. But on an official level, he denied, denied, denied. But when we talk privately, he conceded, conceded, conceded. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a game. I don't think it's a good game. Mm -hmm. I think we, we pay a price when police and other agencies pretend that something isn't a problem when they full well know that it is. How can they not? Okay. What's well, interesting also, and everybody should notice this, you did not talk about any ideological sympathy for the world of Islam. There are those who argue that when Barack Obama became president and went to Cairo to speak to the Muslim world and to basically offer an olive branch to the Muslim world and say to the world of Islam, we haven't treated you well, we're going to treat you much better, you're as good as, you know, you're a religion no different than we are and, uh, and then in the West and that we want to have a rapprochement. And that it's interesting, you've pointed this out also, that at the White House, members of the Muslim Brotherhood are invited. The Muslim Brotherhood was in the front row in Cairo, and the Muslim Brotherhood, in many people argue, a comrade in arms with you, Charles Small, keeps saying over and over again, understand that uh, organizationally, the Muslim Brotherhood is the font from which much of this Islamism comes, and he's very concerned, as are others, that Barack Obama has, he's not anti-American, he's not anti-Christian, not, but he has an empathy for, a sympathy for, an emotional attachment to even, coming out of his own youth, to the Muslim world, and therefore it is difficult for him to be critical of Islamism the way you're comfortable right. being, and that that's part of the problem. To what extent are you sympathetic to that whole line of reasoning because you did not mention it at all? There are two topics. One is Barack Obama himself, and the other is the left wing of the Democratic Party in general. Barack Obama himself, I will say to you uh, seriously and having spent a lot of time researching this, is someone of a Muslim background. Uh, he was born and raised Muslim. He left it and became a Christian. We don't quite know exactly when, but he is himself of Muslim background. Not Islamist, not necessarily practicing, but he was born and raised a Muslim. This is an important fact. I think it is a, a disgrace that uh, it has not been looked at more carefully. It's a whole subject in itself. Let me just point out that his um, paperwork for the public school, I believe, the public school in Indonesia, listen, no, for the Catholic school in Indonesia, lists him as a Muslim. This, and he's publicly uh, shown that he knows the, the call to prayer, these are things that only Muslims, Muslim children are taught. So I'm very certain. Is there a that. therefore to that? To no, you? no, no, there isn't actually. I see that as a very important fact about his biography. I think he has lied about his background. And if you go carefully through the many statements he's made, they're inconsistent, they're self-contradictory. I think this is an important fact about his biography. But are but they practically no, relevant? No, I do not think. Others, others will disagree with me. Frank Gaffney, for example. Okay, so interprets, it's interesting to you, it's but not politically relevant. Politically, Frank Gaffney will tell you that this explains um, Obama's policies and outlook. I will say, no, he fits into the left wing of the Democratic Party. Nobody else over there is any different. Now, so let's now talk about the left wing of the Democratic Party. It is the tradition of the left wing of the Democratic Party, going back 60, 70, 80 years, to reach out to opponents of the United States, the Soviet Union, then the Islamists now. And it is quite striking to see the continuities. Whereas the right 
will want to be armed and to confront. The left will want to reach out a hand, uh, as you said, an olive branch, uh, to have an understanding, to get along, and so forth. These, these are not, um, uh, these are temperamental characteristics that are not even specific to Islamism. Uh, they, we found them in communism as well, and they're certainly not specific to Barack Obama. You find them on the left. You find them in the Democratic Party in general, and on the left wing of it especially. And what's the therefore because of that? Well, what we have is a fundamental difference between the right and the left, half the country over here, half the country over there, on how to deal with Islamism, just as we had with communism, a major debate on how, what's the best way to respond. Is the best way to wear a hijab and uh, keep the fast of Ramadan to show solidarity and make people feel, Muslims feel better? Or is it to confront? Is it to uh, increase the number of Muslims in order to show that we're sympathetic to Islam? Or is it to vet, have extreme vetting of, of Muslims? There are two fundamentally different approaches. And it's not been resolved, though I will say that as time goes on and as political violence continues and as cultural aggressions continue by the Islamists, the numbers who are worried about this problem grows. We can certainly see this in Europe. What you're seeing in Europe more than here is a resistance, a anger. Uh, the Burkini that we talked about would be another example. And more and more you're seeing a, a a wall against Islam, Muslims, minarets, burkinis, uh, Quran, Sharia. Uh, so I think the numbers are growing. And if you look at polls in Europe, I don't know there are such polls in the United States, you see that 60, 70 percent of Europeans believe that Islam is not compatible with Western civilization, the treatment of women is, is unacceptable, and so forth and so on. And those numbers are going up and up and up. Already a quarter of Europeans, roughly speaking, across the board are voting for parties that are generally speaking, anti-Islamic, anti-immigrant. Those numbers are going up, most notably in May in Austria, the vote for president. Now, I grant it's not a very important country, not a very important position, but still, the vote for president was split half-half between the left and the right, the right being hard right, anti-immigrant right. Uh, this, is, this is news. Uh, because these parties generally are isolated, mm -hmm. ostracized, and can get nowhere unless they get 51% of the vote. And they were... Nowhere 50, 30 years ago, they have a quarter of the vote now. Here we have a sudden half the vote, but I think they're heading in that direction. So. Okay. You are not a simple person, Daniel Pipes. You're very complex. <laughs> okay. I mean, that is a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. On the one hand, my guess is that you're more comfortable, you're more uncomfortable with the left position as you describe it in America. At the same time, I think you're uncomfortable with many of the things the right in America well, would want to do. If I'm am complex, I you've, you've simplified me <laughs> accurately. Yes. No, I am on the right, but I'm not happy about the things that the right is doing. And you're against, the, you really think the left has it wrong. I think the left has it wrong. I think the right has it basically correct, but is doing things which are counterproductive, dumb, and mistaken. But I think we have to be sensible about it and be constructive about it. And in particular, we have to reach out to the Muslims. This is a civil war between Muslims, as we can see in the Middle East and other areas of the world. We have our friends. We need to work with our friends. We can't just reject them all. That doesn't get us anywhere. We need to work with Muslims. We need to encourage them. We need to fund them. We need to uh, develop, help them develop their thinking so that they can offer an alternative to the very attractive uh, brew that the Islamists have to offer. Mm -hmm. we, we need to help the, the anti-Islamists find something that's even more attractive mm -hmm. and compelling. How did you feel about the Cairo speech? I thought it was awful. Because? It was pandering. It was weak. It was inaccurate. Obama, for the first few years, he stopped it more recently. He was doing nothing but talking about mutual respect, and how we've done wrong, and the like. He was hoping that he would become the hero of the Muslim world. Well, he hasn't. In fact, when these polls were taken a few years ago, I haven't seen any lately, he had a standing as low as George W. Bush. It was quite striking. Uh, and so Why I think, do you think that's true? 
because obviously he was implementing a different policy and was trying, again, to extend the olive branch. Why didn't it work? Well, because there were other things going on. For example, the drone program hitting Islamist leaders from the sky multiplied many times under, under Obama. The bin Laden seizure and execution. Uh, so he didn't succeed in that. Anyway, among the, the, in the Muslim world, I gave the example of Turkey, there's a lot of resentment of the United States. So having someone with a somewhat Muslim name uh, doesn't cut it. That's not enough. Okay, speak to one other issue that relates to this. To what extent is Islamism at all intertwined with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? To what extent are Palestinians part of this movement, whether it's Fatah or Hamas, for that matter, Hezbollah, but in terms of you know, Gaza and the West Bank and Very this much. attempt to create a two-state solution with the Palestinian people, to what extent do, should Jews understand, should Americans understand, the extent to which Islamism is part of the whole problem? Let me put in perspective. The Arab Israeli or the uh, Zionist is, is, Zionist-Arab conflict has been going on for over a century. The first stage till 1945 was essentially pan-Syrian. Pan-Syrianism was the big ideology. I happen to have written a book on that. The second was pan-Arabism. Gamal Abdel Nasser from Morocco to uh, Iraq. One big country. And they tried. Failed. The third ideology of the Palestinians was Palestinianism. Palestine with a flag, Yasser Arafat, a seat in the United Nations, and so forth. The fourth, uh, by the way, that started about 1967, and the fourth, beginning about 1990, 1987 even, is the Islamist. Now, the PA is still, uh, the Fatah and PLO, and now the PA are all there, but the dynamism is with the Islamist. So you go from pan-Syrian to pan-Arab to Palestinianist to Islamist, and Islamism is now the dominant um, ideology among Palestinians as it is so much in the Middle East. It's On the West Bank as well as Gaza West Bank, oh yeah. yeah. And, uh, so Rank that and is file that. or only leadership? No, it, it is, it's a compelling ideology. It is a way of seeing the world and your place in the world, understanding the world, that makes sense to a lot of people. And it motivates, inspires. It's a very powerful ideology. Now I said before, I think it's weakening, but it's still powerful. And it is the dynamic force against Israel. You mentioned Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, uh, and many other lesser groups are there fighting Israel. Um, but I think at the same time, uh, there are other, other things taking place. The big, the big, the elephant in the room is the Iranian threat. And so this is shifting the Arab-Israeli conflict in a way that has never happened before. States like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, UAE, and others see Iran as the threat. And so they're allowing Israel to be an auxiliary on their team. And they're not, they're mean, I mean, to have a Saudi former general meet publicly and go to Israel. Uh, Sisi is quite, of Egypt, the president of Egypt, is quite sympathetic to Israel. So the whole Palestine issue, as they call it in the uh, Muslim Middle East, has gone down in mm -hmm. a way it never has before. We kept saying, you know, it's got to go down, it's got to go down, but it never did. We kept saying, you know, Iran and other issues have to become more important, but they never were. Now they really are for the first time. Now, I think it's tactical, I think it's temporary, and sh say the Iranian regime uh, collapses. collapses tomorrow so too will this undo itself, but it's important, it's important. Israel is no longer the pariah that it was in the Middle East. But you're saying it's sort of like strange bedfellows. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, not necessarily It's sort of like friend. a man and a mistress. The Israelis are eager to have it be public. <laughs> By and large, the Arab states are not so eager. What do you think of the Iran deal? It was horrible, but it has a potential silver lining. It was just a catastrophic deal. I can't imagine a worse deal. I don't think there was ever such a bad deal in American history. But the silver lining, uh, I won't go into all that. I mean, that's an hour. 
But the silver lining is it created tensions and expectations in Iran, which we're seeing take place right now. Just days ago, a, lead, a leading Iranian negotiator was arrested. Uh, Rouhani, the president who is so avid for this, is in trouble. Uh, it's not working out that way. In other words, the debate is over here. My side lost. Nothing we can do about it. There, because Khamenei himself is of two minds about this, and because the issue is st the debate is still ongoing, it could yet collapse and could, could, it could do real damage to the regime. Mm -hmm. Come back one more moment now to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There are those who argue that you have within in the Palestinian mentality now an Islamist attitude that any land that was ever controlled by the Muslim empire must remain and must, if possible, be Muslim forever. Mm -hmm. And that no foreign entity, or the more so a Zionist entity, but that no foreign entity right. should rule what was once Muslim territory. And that therefore, the real issue here, which many Americans don't understand, is not that the Palestinians are bad people, but they have their own core belief. And their core belief is they cannot live with a Zionist entity anywhere in Palestine. And to the extent to which that is true, especially in, among Palestinian leadership, the idea of a two-state solution where the Palestinians will voluntarily say, we acknowledge the sovereign right of a Jewish state to exist within whatever borders we create. Right. Such a compromise is simply not possible for them. To what extent do you, are you sympathetic to that view? To what extent do you think that view has it wrong? Uh, let me preface my answer by saying that Israel is hardly alone in this situation because, because of the supremacism of Quranic doctrine, every state, every country that's built on land that was once Muslim, yes. whether it be Spain or Hungary or India, all of India was under Muslim rule, is potentially in the same jeopardy. Now, realistically, it's not about to happen, but that sentiment is there. It's certainly alive, for example, in Cyprus, right next to Israel. It's, it's, it's a powerful, the key word here is waqf, W-A-Q-F. Once a territory is under Muslim rule, it becomes part of the Muslim waqf, or mortmain in English. It's permanently, it can't, it can't be renounced, it has to be Muslim. And this is a source of a lot of trouble around the world, Chad, you name it. Uh, so that's just by way of preliminary. On the subject of Israel and two-state solution, I have a rather radical view on the Arab-Israeli conflict. I believe that, uh, looking at things historically, wars come to an end when one side gives up. And it doesn't, they don't come to an end because of compromise, mediation, goodwill. And I can give you lots of examples. Uh, in this case, it can either give up because the Zionist movement says, you know what, we really should have gone to Uganda or Birabijan or, you know, Flatbush. You know, it, this idea of a, of a sovereign Jewish state doesn't work. We'll, we'll, we'll allow the Palestinians or others to rule us and we'll either stay or we'll leave. That's one possible solution. The other solution would be that Israel is there and is sovereign and is strong and is tough and sends a message to the Palestinians and everyone else, we're here, we're permanent, get used to it, come to terms with it, and if you make any trouble, we're gonna, you're gonna pay a very high price. I advocate the second. I call it Israel victory. Uh, I believe in Israeli victory. In other words, I believe that the Palestinians need to lose, Palestinians in particular, Egyptians, Syrians, Jordanians, beyond, Iranians, Malaysians, Moroccans, not so important, it's the Palestinians. The Palestinians need to get a sense that Israel's there and it's permanent and there's nothing they can do about it. And I would like to see the Israelis adopt such a policy and I'd like to see our government encourage the Israelis because that's how you win. Right? That's what we did say in World War II. That's how you win. That's how you end the conflict. And I don't see the two-state solution doing this. The two-state solution gives the Palestinians the idea that they have some part of Jerusalem and they're going to look for more. And I, I, but once the happy day comes that the Palestinians do recognize Israel as a Jewish state and do accept that they 
have lost this long, long war, century-long war, then they're having some kind of state? Yeah. So I'm not against the two-state solution in principle. Mm -hmm. I'm saying in practice at this time, it's an impossibility and should be thrown out. And if we want some uh, practical solution for the meantime, it's what I call a three-state solution, namely Egypt, welcome back to Gaza, Jordan, come back to the areas A and B of um, the West Bank, and neither of them particularly eager to do it, but and neither of them particularly great governments, but you know they're at least reasonable governments. So I would see that. Or the other alternative is just to sit and keep things as they are. The status quo. I, you know, I don't think it's likely to change very much, so, mm -hmm. and it's okay. It could be worse. You're fabulous. <laughs> you, I, I, you know, I said that you are complex, and you're also thorough. And you're also interesting, oh, you. and you're knowledgeable, and there's so much we can learn from you. Well, it is so wonderful whenever you come great here. Great pleasure to be on your uh, I have to tell you, though, I'm only putting a semicolon here. You have to come back. We I have to continue the discussion. And, I enjoy it. And this, is a, this is a time when the insights you have are most important for all of us to hear, not only American Jews, but American non-Jews are watching us all. Of them. You're, we watch right now all over the world. So grateful that you came here. And... Uh, as I said, all the best to you going forward. Thank you. You do wonderful work. Thank you. Daniel Pipes, president of the Middle East Forum and publisher of its Middle East Quarterly Journal. And he has so much to say. You can take all the time you want to digest some of his ideas. And if you have any thoughts of your own you'd like to share either with me or with Daniel Pipes, please email me, write me, Post on our Facebook wall or tweet me. I hope to hear from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.